Shabbat Shalom, everyone. So we can bring up our slides. You don't need your prayer book open, just your eyes and your minds and maybe a little bit of heart too. Um, so this week we are reading a portion of Torah, which is something the Jewish people does every week. And wherever you find yourself in the world, the Jewish people are always reading Torah. And with very few exceptions, wherever you are in the world, it's always the same section of Torah. So it just so happens that the section of Torah that is read at around this time of year, like the deep, dark, cold winter months, is the story of the exodus from Egypt. And the culmination of that story, really the, the climax of the story, is when the Israelites, having been released from bondage from Pharaoh in Egypt, make their way into the Sinai wilderness and arrive at a great mountain. And uh, I forgot, I'm in charge of the slides tonight. So uh, this is the depiction of that mountain. Does anyone know the name of the fabled mountain in the Sinai Desert? Yeah, it's Mount Sinai. We're going to start easy tonight. Okay, Jen? Good. Thank you. Um, now, this is an artist's rendering. Nobody was around to take, you know, like an iPhone photo. Um, we don't know exactly what Mount Sinai looked like, but the Torah uses very descriptive language. But without even reading what the Torah has to say about Mount Sinai, how would you describe this image? What, what words come to your mind? Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, go for it. It sure looks like a volcano, right? That's exactly what I thought someone would say. It looks like a volcano. Here's another question. Are volcanoes creative or destructive? Uh, okay, anyone want to give a different answer? Yeah? No, not destructive. They're creative. So here, it's a trick question. Volcanoes, there's no wrong answer. Volcanoes are terribly destructive. But what often gets missed is that volcanoes are also incredible engines of creation. So much of the world's landmass has been created by volcanic eruption. The lava which comes out as this molten stream of rock that burns everything in its path cools and becomes new land. So a volcano is a great image for what happened at Mount Sinai. Something was destroyed. The Israelites were never going to be the people they were before. They were never again going to be slaves. They were never again going to be told you have to worship a pharaoh. They were going to become servants to God. They were going to become a people. So there was a destruction, a parting of ways with the past, and there was a creation of something new. And this is the language from the Torah about what happens at this moment. Now, Mount Sinai was all in smoke. For Adonai had come down upon it in fire. The smoke rose like the smoke of an oven, and the whole mountain trembled massively. The sound of the shofar grew louder and louder. As Moses spoke, God thundered back a response. Adonai then came down upon Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. Adonai called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. So God is coming down, and Moses is going up. And the two of them are going to meet in this incredible display of smoke and fire and the sound of thunder and the sound of a shofar growing louder and louder. Vaidaber Elohim et kol hadvarim ha'ela lemor, then God spoke all these words saying, and I'm not going to tell you what God said because most of us already know this is the part where God begins to speak the law into being, the Ten Commandments. I am Adonai, your God. I led you out of Egypt to be your God. You shall have no other gods but me. You shall not take the name of God in vain. You should honor your parents, revere the Sabbath. You shall not commit murder, adultery, theft, lying under oath. All of the things that constitute the core of the Jewish ethical tradition. That's what follows. But the rabbis actually say, we don't even need to get into the specific law to have an important conversation about that moment, that moment when God and Moses met in fire and thunder and the sound of the shofar and God spoke. What did they hear? So at the top of this frame, I've invited us to consider something in Jewish tradition called Midrash. 
Midrash comes from a Jewish uh, root word, a Hebrew root word, derash, which means to explain something or explore something. And it is what Jewish people do with text. We have literature, the Torah has been with us for thousands of years, and every week the Jewish people has an encounter with the Torah. And in that encounter, there may not be smoke or fire or thunder, but it's supposed to change you. It's supposed to allow you to become someone different every time you encounter the Torah. And when you make meaning out of that moment, you are engaging in something called Midrash. So everything we're going to look at between here and the end of my very brief talk tonight, we're actually going to make a Midrash together out of some Midrash that has already been made. So what did they hear? Rabbi Yochanan, who lived the better part of 2,000 years ago, said, When God's voice came forth at Mount Sinai, it divided itself into 70 human languages so that the whole world could understand it. Everyone at Mount Sinai, young or old, women, children, and infants, all understood according to their ability to understand. So the rabbis are kind of getting into this idea of, wait a minute, if God was speaking in Hebrew, what do you do about all the folks who were speaking ancient Akkadian, or the people who were from Sumer and they spoke some Sumerian language? What about the people who, you know, had a European tongue or the tongue of the native people from what today is India? They couldn't have understood Hebrew, right? And the rabbis say, no, that's not how it worked. God spoke one thing, but every language, every community, every individual heard it according to one's capacity to understand it. So that sound that went forth might have actually sounded very different once it reached the person's ears and soul. Okay. Go on. It even says that Moses understood only according to his capacity. In other words, even the great Moses, the greatest teacher of the Jewish tradition of all time, Moses only got it to the extent that Moses could get it. Someone else got it to the extent that that someone else could get it. They add a few verses down in this Midrash. Not only did all the prophets receive their prophecy from Sinai, but all the sages, sages are the teachers of the Jewish tradition, including some of the people in this room. Anyone here a teacher of the Jewish tradition? We have a whole bunch of us here tonight, not just rabbis and cantors. We have our incredible education staff from the JLL. Right? All the teachers of the Jewish tradition heard the prophecy at Sinai. Each and every one of them received their wisdom from Sinai. So what the, what the rabbis are saying in this midrash is, even this conversation we're having tonight, Every time we gather together to learn Torah, we're receiving a message from Sinai. It's not just that it happened in that moment, and then the moment was over, and the Jewish teaching that followed had nothing to do with that moment. It's actually that that moment is going on and on and on through the wisdom that is being transmitted to the Jewish people even today. Now, I have asked for a few helpers to play the parts of narrator and rabbis in a modern midrash that was written by our friend and teacher, Rabbi Larry Kushner. Um, so, Rabbi Citrin, will you be the narrator? And then I want to make sure that I have the right list. I've got Rabbi number one is going to be played by Matthew Goldfarb. Where are you, Matthew? Right here. Great. Rabbi number two is Elliot Bass. Where are you, Elliot? I... Thank you. Wait, you're in the back there. I... Thank you. Yep, I see you now. Rabbi number three is Lily Harrison. Where are you, Lily? Where are you? Next to Thank, Oh, right next to Elliot. Okay, perfect. And Samara Fieldston is rabbi number four. Where are you? Oh, you're all next to each other. This is very convenient for me. Okay. <laughs> rabbi Citrum, will you begin this modern midrash? No one really knows for sure what happened on Mount Sinai. One time, the rabbis were arguing about it. Yeah, you're rabbi number one. At Mount Sinai, God spoke the entire Torah to all the children of Israel, and Moses wrote it down as God spoke. Okay, this is the traditional wisdom, right? God spoke, Moses wrote it down as it was being communicated to the children of Israel, to the Israelites. It was a single communication, it got written down, there it is, in each of those Torah scrolls. Simple, right? Not so simple. The rabbis have more to say. Okay, so our second rabbi is Elliot Bass. No, it says that the Torah that the children of Israel heard only the Ten Commandments that were carved in stone with the finger of God. 
So no, it wasn't the whole Torah. Moses would have been up there forever. It takes the Jewish people a whole year to read the Torah. Moses was only on Mount Sinai for like 40 days. So it must have just been the Ten Commandments. Rabbis do what they do, which is argue with each other. Who's rabbi number three? Okay, that's Lily. No, no, the people could not handle hearing all of that. It would be too much for them. They only heard God say the first word of Ten Commandments. Anohi. Anohi. And then the entire world went totally silent. Not even a bird chirped or a frog croaked. croaked. And Anohi means I am. Basically, they heard God saying, I exist, I'm real. So this rabbi comes in and says, no, 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 no. This was not like a transmission of a long voicemail message. It wasn't even God reciting the Ten Commandments. It was one word. It was Anohi. Here I am. God is real. And that's what the people heard in that moment. And everything else, we've been making Midrash. We've been telling the story of our people based on that one moment, that one encounter, one word. Now I'm going to have to hand you the microphone. Hold it close, okay? Rabbi number four jumps into the conversation and she says, No, no, no. Not even the first word, Anochi, was heard. All that God spoke was the first letter of the first word of the first commandment. As Sani, yep. Sani, all the people of Israel needed to hear what the sound of Aleph, it meant that God and the Jewish people could have a conversation. Thank you so much, Samara. So what sound does an Aleph make? Ah. Ah, somebody said, wait a minute. No, it's silent. Aleph makes the sound of whatever vowel you put next to it, or under it, or on top of it. Alone, it makes no sound, or some say it makes this sound. Just air. I'm not moving my vocal cords. I'm just breathing. Something's happening in that olive. You have to listen very carefully, though, to hear an olive. So this fourth very wise rabbi wants to suggest, maybe God didn't even to, need to announce, Anochi, here I am. Maybe the people needed to be so quiet that they could just hear, they could hear something, something that begins a conversation. Our narrator? Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah, teaches that Aleph contains the entire Torah, but not everyone hears the gentle sound of Aleph. People are able to hear only what they are ready to hear. God speaks to each of us in a personal way, taking into consideration our strength, wisdom, and preparation. So, especially for our sixth grade community, our students, our parents, Sometime between now and this time two years from now, sometime during your seventh or the first part of your eighth grade year, each of you will have your moment at Mount Sinai. We're not going to send you over to Egypt. We're just going to recreate it right here on the Bema of Westchester Reformed Temple. Moses had the very first aliyah to the Torah. He was called up to the top of this high place he received the wisdom from God at Mount Sinai, and he gave it to all the people of Israel, and indeed to all the world. And we, the Jewish people, have been the guardians of that conversation ever since. Tonight, when we thought about Torah, we talked about Torah, we heard the voices of four young rabbis in the community, we actually participated in the unfolding revelation of Torah that began at Sinai. It is natural for a sixth grader to say, oh my goodness, how am I going to learn all of this? How am I going to master chanting verses of Torah and le leading prayers? And how am I going to take this very, very old book that speaks in this very mysterious way in a foreign language and actually find something meaningful to teach to my family, my friends, my community, my congregation? The answer is all you need to do is listen. Listen for the silent sound of the Aleph, and remember that you were there at Sinai, and that your teachers, your rabbis, your cantors, for those of you who are coming up who have had older brothers or sisters who've celebrated Bar and Bat Mitzvah before you, 
For those of you who have parents or grandparents who have been part of the Jewish tradition, who have done so much to make sure that you would also receive the Jewish tradition in your life, you're going to be in a conversation with them too. You're going to talk to your mom and dad about what does Judaism mean to you and why should it be important to me? If you're blessed to have living grandparents, you're going to talk to them too and hear the stories of what they have done to make sure that Judaism would survive and thrive throughout their lives, in the lives of your parents, and in your life. You don't have to know as much Torah as Moses did. Even Moses didn't know it all. We learned that tonight, too. All you have to do is listen and be ready to learn, and let's keep the conversation going and going and going. Shabbat shalom.